Well, welcome to International Church of Bangkok. Thank you so much for joining us for this time of worship today. I'm so happy that you have decided to join with us uh, on our Facebook page. You may find a link to our today's worship uh, bulletin that enables you to know more about our church, but also provides you with the order of worship and the links to the different songs. And so you're invited to pull that up. Also on our Facebook page is a link to the slides for today. You're invited to use those uh, however you wish. They will help you in today's service as well. And then lastly, you have a link to our song playlist. And so following the service, at some point today, I invite you to click on that link and to join together in lifting up your hearts and in singing your praises to Almighty God. And so thank you again for joining us for this time of worship. And as we begin, let's quiet our hearts before God in prayer.
Well, welcome once again to International Church of Bangkok. My name is Pastor Clifton, and I'm so happy that you have decided to join with us in our worship service today. We are an international church located here in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, we have been unable to worship in person for several weeks now. And so thank you for continuing to worship with us online, either on our Facebook page or our YouTube channel. If this is your first time to join us in worship, we are very pleased to have you with us and you're invited to type in a note uh, to let us know who you are so that we can in turn reach out and encourage you on your journey of faith. One thing that we believe is that we find peace for our lives in the Lord Jesus Christ, that as we put our trust and our faith in him, he brings us peace. But that also means that he calls us to be peacemakers in his world, to make peace with those around us in our home and in our work and in our communities. And so each week we symbolically pass the peace of Christ to one another, and then we also pray for peace in this world. And so I invite you to pass the peace of Christ to those with whom you are worshiping, whether they be a family member or a roommate, or if you're alone, then you're invited to type in on the Facebook page, the peace of Christ be with you. And so as we pass the peace of Christ, the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. Amen. The International Church of Bangkok believes strongly in promoting peace. We believe that in Jesus we find the Prince of Peace. Every week we light the peace candle along with other churches around the world as we all pray, wait, hope, and work toward peace together trusting that the Holy Spirit will guide and sustain us. This week in our yearly prayer cycle, we are covering India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, as well as Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal. India, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka have all been suffering from inter-religious strife, scenes of religious violence between Muslims and Hindus in India's capital, New Delhi, may be fresh in our minds from February. Pakistan is home to Christian persecution that has displaced thousands, including members of our church. About a year ago on Easter Sunday, 2019, bombs ripped through churches and hotels in Sri Lanka, killing about 300 people in another example of Christian persecution. Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal have been in the news for different reasons. Bhutan is a tiny remote uh, Himalayan kingdom of about 760,000 people. A least developed country, it is also notable for the relative absence of corruption and its focus on gross national happiness. Nepal is a mountainous country, of course, home to Mount Everest. It is among the region's poorest countries and relies heavily on aid and tourism, which has been disrupted by COVID-19. Nepal suffered from the April 2015 earthquake that killed thousands. Bangladesh is a developing country, the eighth most populous in the world. Many workers in its prominent garment manufacturing and export industry have lost jobs due to COVID-19. Bangladesh is also a receiving ground for Rohingya refugees from Myanmar, hundreds of whom have found themselves at sea literally lately, having taken off in from Bangladesh in boats that then were denied permission to dock in Malaysia, um, leaving the boats adrift in a situation the UN called a dangerous game of human ping pong. Let us pray. God, we offer a prayer for peace, especially in India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and Nepal. We lift up people who suffer for their faith. We lift up people suffering poverty, especially those who may have climbed up the ladder to jobs who have now, due to COVID-19, fallen back down. We pray for all people on the margins, all people suffering uncertainty and anxiety, all people who hunger, all people who are sick. 
We give thanks for the diverse people in this week's prayer countries, for the breathtaking beauty of these lands, the mountains in all their grandeur, overflowing rivers, green paddy fields. Thank you, God, for the resilience of minority groups and those who fight discrimination and persecution. Thank you, God, for efforts to forge interreligious solidarity for the sake of the common good. We pray again for those who struggle, for the efforts of governments and others to build up economies. We pray for those in the process of recovery from earthquake, those in the midst of being caught up in the pandemic as they struggle to rebuild their lives, and those whose family members and friends suffered persecution. We take a moment of this Eastertide 2020 to remember the hundreds of lives lost in Sri Lanka on Easter Sunday 2019. God, we pray for those who contribute to religious harmony. We pray for nations which depend on other countries and are often threatened by those countries' interests. Finally, God, we pray for all who work to ensure the rights of all people, especially those on the margins. And we ask for leaders to keep priority on the well-being of the people and the earth. God, give us strength to confront the places in our lives and society where peace is not the way of life, and lead us to act in a way that promotes love and peace in the face of injustice. Amen. Hello, my name is Bosco. Please join me in saying the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in the God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the God, the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. kids. My name is Teacher Cora. For the month of May, we have a life application and the word is determination. Determination is a big word. It means deciding it's worth it to finish what you started. So determination means you don't give up. If you start something, you keep going no matter how hard it gets until you get to the end. We have a Bible story that talks about some people who needed determination. If you remember, we talked at Easter time about how Jesus died and came alive again. And there were a group of people that followed Jesus that were called his disciples. And the disciples had been following Jesus. They had determination. They stayed with him when he died and when he came alive again. But now it was time for Jesus to go back into heaven. And the disciples would need determination to be able to do what Jesus wanted them to do. I'm going to read from the end of Matthew 28. So Matthew 28 starting in verse 18, says, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, so you must go and make disciples of all nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to obey everything I have commanded you, and you can be sure that I am always with you to the very end. Well, this was something that was going to be hard for the disciples. 
Their job was to go tell everyone in the whole world about Jesus. And Jesus was going back into heaven, so he said he would be with them, but he was going back into heaven. That seemed kind of strange to them. This seemed like something that was impossible and they didn't know what they were going to do. But Jesus gave them some more instructions. I'm reading now in the book of Acts chapter 1 starting in verse 4. It says, One day Jesus was eating with them. He gave them a command. Do not leave Jerusalem, he said. Wait for the gift my father promised. You have heard me talk about it. John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So Jesus gave them the command to share the news with everyone, but he said, wait, first I need you to stay here and I'm going to give something to you. Now the disciples could have been confused. They could have said, Jesus, we don't want to follow you anymore. This sounds too hard or we're too confused or we don't know what's happening next. But instead the disciples decided to listen to Jesus. They said, Jesus will listen to what you say and we'll do what you want us to do. So here the disciples are showing that they have determination. They decided that they were going to stick with Jesus no matter what. Sometimes in our lives we have things that we think are hard. Jesus wants us to love other people or to listen to our parents without complaining and we might think that that's hard and that we're not strong enough to do it by ourselves and that's true we're not strong enough to do it by ourselves but you'll find out next week how Jesus is helping his disciples and the gifts that he gives to them but for now what we need to remember is that we can trust God no matter what. That's our basic truth. And our bottom line says, keep going, even when it seems impossible. So the disciples decided even though it seemed like something that was impossible, they were still going to trust Jesus. So for you, think of something this week that might seem impossible, someone that you need to be kind to or respect or listen to, and trust that God can help you to have determination. Well, I invite us to continue in our worship of God through our giving. It's where we are able as an act of worship to give God our tithes and our offerings. It's a reminder for each of us that every part of our lives is truly a gift from God. And so we give back to him a portion of what he has given to us as a time to worship God and also to further his ministries. You see on the screen our bank information as a church. You are invited to make a bank transfer. The money that is received goes to support all that we do here as a church. And then 5% of what we receive each year is then shared with nine outreach partner ministries. The ministry that we're bringing to your attention today is one in the very far southern part of Thailand called Cornerstone Chapel Hadjai. And so you're invited to make a special gift to them as well. You may do so through the bank transfer and then just send us an email letting us know that your gift goes to our outreach partner. But let's continue in our worship of God through our giving.
This week's scripture passage comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 11 through 17. Beloved, I urge you as aliens and exiles to abstain from the desires of the flesh that wage war against the soul. Conduct yourselves honorably among the Gentiles, so that though they malign you as evildoers, they may see your honorable deeds and glorify God when he comes to judge. For the Lord's sake, accept the authority of every human institution, whether of the emperor as supreme, or of governors as sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to praise those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing right, you should silence the ignorance of the foolish. As servants of God, live as free people, yet do not use your freedom as a pretext for evil. Honor everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, today we are going to continue our series that we began a few weeks ago, talking about living our lives as refugees, finding hope in a world that's not our own. Uh, before we begin, thank you again to Reverend Chi for leading us in worship last Sunday and, and in preaching. And you will hear more about our congregational meeting and the congregational vote following the sermon with a message from Margaret McMillian, the chair of our church council. Let me remind you of where we've been in our series. Uh, we began a few weeks ago, right after Easter, looking at the study of First Peter and how we are focused in our desire to live our lives holy, to live our lives living for God. And so we began our study of First Peter by looking at the reality that we find our hope not in the world, not in a vaccine, not in the amount of money we may have in our bank account, but that we find our hope in Christ. And that because Jesus is alive, because he was risen from the dead, then we find hope for our lives. No matter where we may be, no matter what's going on in the world, but that we find our hope in Christ. And then we looked at that we are called to holiness that God has called us to live holy lives, that God has called us to live lives that are set apart for him. It was that key verse from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 15 and 16, but just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, be holy because I am holy. So we looked at that wonderful call from God that we are to live our lives as holy people. But it's also that wonderful gift of God's grace, this gift of God's grace for us, that as we trust in the risen Savior Jesus, he makes our lives holy. Well, today we are going to continue the series by looking at living as refugees. When we have this call upon our lives to live holy, to be holy, what does that truly mean in a very practical level as we live here in Bangkok over a couple many millenniums after this time that the letter was written? So what does that mean for us? How can we live our lives full of God's hope in holiness in the here and now. Well, what I invite you to do is to open up your Bibles to 1 Peter, and we will begin with our study in chapter 2. We're going to look at verses 11 to 17 in 1 Peter. And so let's look at our scripture together. What we first see is verse 11. And so let me read that to you. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires, which wage war against your soul. 
Now, the new international version uh, phrases it slightly differently. And so you don't really get to feel the passion that Peter is writing. Uh, I love how J.B. Phillips phrases that very first section. He says, I beg you as those whom I love. And here he is reminding them of how dearly he loved his fellow believers. And so I, as your pastor, remind you, I beg you, I encourage you as people whom I love. And then we see that phrase, as foreigners and exiles, or as I have phrased it, as refugees, we are to live our lives abstaining from sinful desires. Now that phrase is foreigners and exiles, that goes back to what was repeated earlier that we talked about a couple weeks ago in chapter one, verse 17. We are to live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. Not reverent fear of disease, not reverent fear of the government, not reverent fear of losing your job, but it's placing our lives in God's hands, realizing that almighty and all-powerful God loves us, cares for us, and also calls us to be holy. And so we are to live our lives as people who are only here for a season, who are only here for a brief period of time, and live our lives wholly. Now we do that by first abstaining from sinful desires, not doing what our sinful desires may be leading us to do, for they wage war against our souls. The author of 1 John chapter 2, 16 phrases it this way. He says, for everything in the world the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. There are many desires that you may have that are truly desires that come from the world, come from your culture, come from advertisements that are truly not from God. They may not necessarily seem as sinful desires, but yet they lead you more in love with the world and less in love with God. Now, the Apostle Paul phrased this in a longer passage when he was comparing the acts of the flesh with the gifts of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians. Hear this from Galatians 5, 19 to 21 where the Apostle Paul writes, the acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery. Now, let me just stop there and say that when we think about sinfulness and when we think about abstaining from sinful desires or acts of the flesh, most often we end up thinking about sexual uh, immorality sexual means that are outside that confines of a heterosexual marriage. And yet when Paul deems this as acts of the flesh, and when Peter deems that we are to abstain from sinful desires, they are both talking about more than immorality and sexuality. They're talking about every area of our lives that are not pleasing to God. Every area of our lives where the world has crept into our heart and into our passions and replaced God on the throne of our lives. Well, hear this verse from Galatians 5, 19. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, 
and orgies and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so what we see in Paul's writings, as well as in Peter's writing, is that we are to turn away. We are to abstain. We are to push back against all that the world pushes towards us. The world and, and our country say that, well, we are the best. My race is the best. My nationality is the best. My team is the best. My workplace is the best. And in turn, it, it creates hatred. It creates discord. It, it creates anger. It creates selfishness. And all of this greed, all of this envy, all of this pride is to be set aside. Because they're all taking that place of the what is center on our hearts. What's center in our lives. And the holiness, that call the holiness, is to put God at the center of all that we are, to live as different people. Now, you may think that this is impossible, that, that there's no way that we can abstain from sinful desires. But the reality is you can God has promised to give you his power and his ability, his strength to live within you, to help you, to live differently. It starts in, in the thoughts that you have. And you, believe it or not, can control the thoughts that you have. So let's just imagine you're, you're at work, maybe you're in a Zoom meeting, whatever it may be, and something does not go your way. Maybe your boss says something that is belittling, that is very mean-spirited. Maybe somebody takes credit for your product, for your project, and you get angry. What do you do with that? The anger comes to your mind. It comes into your heart. What do you do with that? Are you willing to hand that to God and pray for God's blessing upon your coworker, upon your boss, upon your spouse, or are you going to dwell with that anger? Are you going to spew forth words of hatred, words that will cause discord and separation and pain? Are you going to keep on dwelling in your mind how you want to seek revenge? Or are you going to turn it over to God? We are called to abstain from sinful desires. Or as James puts it, therefore anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Just think about that. Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world, to find peace in this world, to put our hope in this world, to find our joy in this world, they become an enemy of God. And so we are called, first and foremost, to abstain from sinful desires. And in turn, we are called to live good lives. 1 Peter 2, 12, our, our primary text for today, phrases it this way. He says, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Now, let me just share with you a little bit of the context or remind you a little bit of the context. Uh, Peter was writing to Christians who were going through times of persecution. Uh, we are not positive whether it was during the time of Caesar Nero and and governmental persecution that began to sweep through the Roman Empire, or whether it was societal persecution, because they weren't going with the society, because their lives looked differently, 
then their neighbors began to tell lies about them, began to slander them, began to speak poorly, to, to have all sorts of rumors and lies told that cause pain. And here Peter is telling them, ignore all that. Turn away from everything that you know is wrong and live your lives in a way that is holy and pleasing to God. Live such good lives that even those who accuse you will see your life and they'll glorify God. Now, this echoes exactly what Jesus taught on the Sermon on the Mount from Gospel of Matthew chapter 5, where Jesus said, In the same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven so that people will see your life. They will notice how you live. They will notice how you interact, not only with them, but with others. They will notice your life and they'll honor and they'll glorify God. I love how William Barclay puts it because he, he states really the truth of the scriptures. William Barclay phrases it this way, he says, here is a timeless truth. Whether we like it or not, every Christian is an advertisement for Christianity. By his life, he either commends it to others or makes them think less of it. Just think about that. Your life is an advertisement to those around you of what it means to follow Jesus. As you think about your own life and especially your life in the workplace or, or your life in school, you may be the only Christian in your class. You may be the only Christian in your office and people are noticing how you live. They are noticing how you react to success, how you react to failure, how you react to problems. And all of that is an advertisement to them of what it means to follow Jesus. Now, an interesting just aside, uh, there is Plato one time was uh, being told that different people were saying things about him and they weren't very nice. They were slandering him. And his reply was this, I will live in such a way that no one will believe what he says. And I have found that is true. That when people say bad things about you, if you live your lives in a way that is good and holy and pleasing, Nobody will believe those lies because they can say, well, obviously he's not that way. Obviously she's not that way. Just look at their life. Look at their life. They're living holy and pleasing. All right, so we are to abstain from sinful desires. We are to live good lives. And then verses 13 to 15 of our primary text. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake, to every human authority, whether to the emperor as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and to commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. And so we are called to respect authority. We are called as followers of Jesus, as we live our lives pursuing holiness, pursuing a life that reflects Jesus, we are called to respect authority. So we are called to respect every human authority. This means your boss. This means the government. This means your local officials. This means your family elder. 
names. As children, this means your parents. We are to submit our lives to them and to be obedient to their authority. Now this has a very practical implication because as we do, then we won't be punished for doing what's wrong. In fact, we'll be commended for doing what is right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence all those who slander you. And so we are to submit our lives to those who have authority over us. Now, as we do that, then we will honor and will glorify God. And we are able to live in peace. Now, the Apostle Paul in Romans phrases it maybe a little bit harder for us. He says <clears throat> in Romans 13, 1, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Let everyone be subject to the governing authorities. We are to live our lives by placing ourselves under authority. We are to be under God's authority, but also under authority of those above us, both in our workplace and in our government. Now, I know that this may seem very tricky, very struggling. As you look at your political leaders, it may seem next to impossible to submit to them. And yet we believe as Christians that God has had a hand in placing them over you. So practically, this means that we are to pay our taxes. Jesus said in the Gospel of Matthew 22, when the religious leaders were trying to trap him, he, they were trying to trap him on whether he should pay taxes or not. And then Jesus responded simply, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's are called to give back to God what is his and to pay our taxes. Whether we believe that the government will use it wisely or not, we are to obey their laws. First Peter puts it this way, first Peter 2 verses 1 and 2. He says, I urge you then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful, quiet lives in godliness and in holiness. So I think practically we are to pay our taxes, we are to obey the laws, even the traffic laws, even the quarantine laws, we are to obey the rules that in the country to which we live. But we're also to pray for them, to pray for all those in authority. And so we are to pray for our prime minister. We are to pray for our king. We are to pray for our president. We are to pray for our governor. We are to pray for our mayor, our boss, all those in authority. Praying that God will give them wisdom, that God will give them the courage to make the decisions that are best for us and for all of the people in their, in their means of authority. As we do so, uh, we live lives of holiness. Now, let me remind you that this does not mean that we will always obey what those in authority tell us to do. There may be times when we have to obey God as opposed to those in authority. This was the case for the early Christians in the book of Acts where it says, Acts 5, 20, 29. 
Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. And so there may be times where you have to obey God as opposed to the government. But when you do, be forewarned, then you need to suffer the consequences. You need to be aware of that and continue to be faithful to Almighty God. And so we are to be faithful to God and to obey him, regardless of the consequences. Because when we live our lives and put our lives in God's hands, then we are truly free, free from the world around us, free from everything. Here, verse 16 of our main text, live as free people, but do not use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Live as God's slaves. Now, just think about that. We are to live as free people. We have been freed from sinfulness. We've been freed from that control that Satan had over us. We have been set free as we trusted in the risen Savior, Jesus, that he has brought us freedom, that he has brought us victory, that he has declared victory over our lives and empowered us with his Holy Spirit so that we can live lives of blessing to him and blessing to the world. But this freedom is not so that we can consistently turn for God's grace and live our lives however we want to, knowing that he will forgive us. It's not for that. We are now set free from the domination of sin so that now we can live as God's servants, or as Peter puts it, as God's slaves. The Apostle Paul phrases it a little bit different, maybe nicer for us to understand, he says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. We are to use our freedom not to satisfy all of our desires, not to satisfy all of our wants, not to align our lives with the world, but we are called to be free so that we can serve God, so that we can serve others, so that we can serve one another humbly in love. Again, I love how William Barclay puts it. He says, Christian freedom does not mean being free to do as we like. It means being free to do as we ought. When we are free, we are no longer under the control of our sinful desires. But now we are under control and empowered by God's Holy Spirit so that we can live our lives how we should. So that we can live our lives on purpose, glorifying and honoring God in every part of our lives. This past week, I read a commentary by Grant Osborne, and he provides a, a longer quote that was from uh, Diognetus, uh, a second century Roman. Let me read it to you because it's a beautiful description of who we are as Christians. Now, remember, this was in the second century, so this was a long time ago, and yet it still reflects who we are. Hear this, Christians are not different from the rest of men in nationality, speech, or customs. They do not live in states of their own, nor do they use a special language, nor adopt a peculiar way of life. Their teaching is not the kind of thing that could be discovered by the wisdom or reflection of mere active-minded men. Indeed, they are not outstanding in human learning as others are. Whether fortune has given them a home in a Greek or foreign city, they follow local custom 
in the matter of dress, food, and way of life. Yet the character of the culture they reveal is marvelous, and it must be admitted unusual. They live each in his native land, but as though they were not really at home there. They share all duties like citizens and suffer all hardships like strangers. Every foreign land is for them a fatherland, and every fatherland a foreign land. They marry like the rest of men and beget children, but they do not abandon their babies that are born. They share a common board, but not a common bed. In the flesh as they are, they do not live according to the flesh. They dwell on earth but they are citizens of heaven. They obey the laws that men make, but their lives are better than the laws. They love all men, but are persecuted by all. They are unknown, and yet they are condemned. They are put to death, yet are more alive than ever. They are paupers, but they make many rich. They lack all things, and yet in all things they abound. They are dishonored, yet glory in their dishonor. They are maligned, and yet are vindicated. They are reviled, and yet they bless. They suffer insult, yet they pay respect. They do good, yet are punished with the wicked. When they are punished, they rejoice, as though they were getting more of life. This is who we are called to be. As we follow that risen Savior Jesus, we are called to live differently, to live as foreigners, as refugees here in this world, to be holy. All right, so let's see what this means practically. Uh, therefore, verse 17. This is those final four practical points of how we are to live our lives. Verse 17, show proper respect for everyone. Love the family of believers, fear God, honor the emperor. All right, so let's just take this point by point. Therefore, show respect to everyone. We are to see the intrinsic value of every single person. That each person, no matter, no matter who they are, no matter their nationality, no matter their race, their language, their wealth, their position, everyone is made in the image of God and God loves them. And so we are to respect them. We are to honor them. We are to show them how deeply God loves them. Whether they be your spouse, whether they be your child, your coworker, your boss, a street vendor, a homeless person, whomever it may be, you are to show them respect, to show them how much God loves them. We are also called to not only respect everyone, but that we are called to love our fellow believers. That when we put our trust and faith in that risen Savior Jesus, we become part of the body of Christ. And so we are united together, no matter where we may be in this world, that we are united together with our fellow believers. And so we are to love them. That one trait that should be evident in God's church, no matter where that church may be, is that element of love. 
that we come into that community of faith in love, that we become part of that family of God where love is so prevalent. And so we are to love those around us, even those that are hard to love, even those that are difficult to love, even those that maybe we don't ever want to admit, but maybe we would rather them not be in our church. We are called to love them with the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so we are to show respect to everyone. We're to love fellow believers, and we are to fear God. We are to live our lives in the presence of Almighty God, knowing that one day, whether that is today or in a decade or two, whatever it may be, that one day we will be brought into God's eternal presence. We will stand before his holy and his righteous throne. And so just as Jesus said, we are not to fear those who may kill the body, but we are to fear him who puts us in heaven or into hell. We are to submit our lives into God's hands. We are to submit our lives into God's hands and to live every part of our lives in a way that honors and glorifies him. Okay, so we are to show respect. We're to love our fellow believers. We're to fear God. And then we are to honor those in authority. We're to give them honor. Whether we agree with their policies, whether we agree with their lifestyle, we are to honor them, to respect them, to pray for them, to encourage them. And in nations where it is possible, we are to work towards bringing about what we feel is holy and right as Christians but we are to do so within the law in the way that is honoring and glorifying to God. Now, as we do those, those four practical things, those four simple things, then I think that we take those steps towards holiness. We take those steps towards Christ. We take those steps to where it's easier to put our faith and our trust in Jesus and receive that wonderful gift of his grace and his mercy to enable us to live holy lives. Or as he has promised in 1 Thessalonians 4, it is God's will that you should be sanctified. For God did not call us to be impure, but to live a holy life. God has called you to live your life holy and pleasing, to live your life as a refugee in this world, and he has promised to sanctify you, to make you holy, to help you. And so will you respond in some practical ways? How will you do so this week? Let's pray together. Almighty and most holy God, we come before you not just as men and women, as boys and girls created in your image, but we come to you in the name of Jesus, putting our trust and our faith in that risen Savior. And so we come to you as your beloved children, as adopted children into your holy family. And so we ask, I humbly ask, not only for me, but for each person who hears this message, that your spirit of grace and your spirit of love and mercy will be poured upon us afresh. Overwhelm us with your grace. Bring us into your eternal presence. 
as we do, reveal those things in our lives where we have sided with the world. Reveal to us those areas where we have pursued sinfulness instead of pursuing you. Reveal to us who sits on the throne of our hearts. Is it us? Is it work? Is it pleasure? Or is it you? Give us the courage and the strength that we need, Lord Jesus, to turn away from all of that and to run back into your arms of grace. And then I humbly ask for your spirit to empower us to live good lives, to live holy lives, to live lives that are pleasing and honoring to you so that as others see us at school or at work, in our home, as others see us, they will honor and glorify you. For they will see you through our lives. Help us, Lord, to live as free people and yet as your servants. And as we do, help us to submit to the authorities around us, to honor them, to respect them, and to live our lives in a way that please, pleases you in every area of our lives. Hear our prayers. Today we also pray for all those lives that are being deeply affected by the pandemic, especially those who have lost their jobs and who are struggling to make ends meet. You are the great provider. And so move in miraculous ways, touch the hearts that are needed to provide for your people. We pray this in the name of Jesus as we pray together our Lord's Prayer, as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, due to the continued state of emergency in Bangkok, uh, we have decided to cancel all of our in-person worship services and small groups through the end of May. Uh, we are hoping that we'll be able to be back worshiping in person uh, beginning the first Sunday in June. And so until then, you are invited to join us each Sunday on either our Facebook page or our YouTube channel for our time of worship. Uh, please let me know and let us know if there's any ways that we can help you during this time and especially how we can be praying for you. We do have another wonderful announcement, and so I now turn it over to Margaret McMillian as she presents that announcement coming from our church council. Good morning. By now you have received the news that the congregation approved the call of Pastor Chi Kyung Yong at its meeting last Sunday. The final tally was yes, 41, no, 3, abstain, 3. The yes votes exceeded the two-thirds majority of those voting required in the church constitution to approve a pastoral call. Carl Straub, the chair of the search committee, has advised Pastor Chi 
that the congregation has approved his call. Carl and the church council have begun the process that will bring Pastor Chi to Thailand in approximately three months. This week, we requested the approval of our call from District 6 of the Church of Christ in Thailand. After the district approves the call, it will be sent to the National Council of the CCT for its approval. I would like to thank Carl and all the members of the search committee for their diligent work in bringing us to this point in the pastoral search. I also thank you, the congregation, for your active participation in last Sunday's meeting. As we prepare to welcome Pastor Chi, we must also think about our farewell to Pastor Clifton, Lindsay, Susie, Annabelle, and Emma. My fervent hope is that by June, we will be able to meet together once more. In the meantime, if you have suggestions about how we might say goodbye, please send them to Tony Alba, the chair of the fellowship committee, and me. If you wish to help organize the farewell, please let me know. The coming months will be a time of transition. There are many unknowns due to the pandemic. Carl and I will do our best to keep you updated. We ask for your prayers for an easy and smooth process. Thank you and God's peace be with you. Thank you very much, Margaret and receive now this benediction and this blessing that as we leave our time of worship together today, may God's spirit fill you, empower you, and bless you so that no matter where you are in this city, no matter where you are in this world, you will be a blessing for Almighty God. Go in peace in the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
Well, thank you again for joining us for this time of worship. I hope to see you next Sunday at 10 o'clock, either here on the YouTube channel or our Facebook page. Have a great week. God bless you.